Hello everybody, Andrew here from the Hero Game Channel. Welcome back to the New Order and to a new playthrough since we finished our Scotland one last time. So I thought, we'll, uh, we'll dive into the mess that is, um, well, the old Soviet Union. And there's only one man that I really wanted to play as. It's our boy, Konstantin Rokosovsky, who I have to say is a long way from home. Um, since, you know, he's actually Polish. But um, anyways... Uh, the Ural Military District. As the Great Patriotic War was lost and the Union collapsed, the valiant soldiers of the Soviet Third Army fled to the Urals to regroup. There they found an ally of circumstance and the irrelevant Arpitak Arapnik Lazar Graganovich, who proclaimed the West Siberian People's Republic with their support. As the terror bombing began and the Republic spiraled into disarray, the Third Army's leader took it upon himself to protect the Russian people from all manner of tyranny. That man was Marshal Konstantin. Konstantinovich Rokosovsky, didn't know he had a middle name, who rallied his forces and proclaimed a provisional government in the city of Sverdlovsk. Uh, lacks any defined ideological, uh, ideological characteristics, instead, it remains a fairly benevolent military dictatorship ruled by Rokosovsky and his officer comrades. The military is a formidable force commanded by Pavel Ivanovich Bast Batov. Batov. It consists of the Third Army. A significant number of auxiliary units raised from the uh, population of Sverdlovsk. It also employs some of the most skilled generals in all of Russia. Control of the city of Sverdlovsk provides the district with access to a sizable industrial base, which in turn has created a stable and relatively higher quality of life than most of the warlords. Despite all this, um, internal situation is shaky. A great deal of citizenry is at least sympathetic to to and having only defected involuntarily when the Third Army garrisons turned up on their doorstep. As a result, spies and saboteurs own allegiance to Graganovich run rampant. Desertion are a constant problem. The military, must, uh, much of which has been conscripted, faces a similar problem with the added threat of the Black League infiltration. Externally, the situation is just um, perilous. The self truman plots to return, uh, the return of the West Siberian People's Republic in the Black s City of Omsk stirs in preparation for the coming conflict. In the north, the motivations of the bandit state of Ugra and the NKVD holdouts in Vorkuta are unknown. But for now, they pose little threat. Uh, we have trusted allies to the north east. The free aviators stand with the marshal. The Merchant Republic of Zatost is always willing to do business with the Third Army, for a price, of course. Rokosovsky grows old and weaker by the day, yet his resolve remains unshakable. He is, a cert he is certain that even if he does not complete his mission, his comrades in arms will. History will judge whether or not the old marshal is right. Grand. Purge the Red Army of unsavory elements or face consequences. Continue the military government or establish a semi-functional democracy. Serve the people of Russia and reunite the fractured motherland. Okay. I'm not going to go ahead and read this. But uh, mobilize the interest rate rally armies to rebuild Western Siberia. Get out the crimson flag of the Black League. Utilize superior industry to conquer Western Russia. And time is right. Do not forget about the Southern Urals. Gear for the inevitable war against Germany. Oh ho 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 ho! And what's in here that we need to really... That's fine. And then the mod info. Right, let's get into this. So I am going to be doing a lot more reading in these playthroughs. I've decided that we're going to do as much reading as I think is necessary. Um, so apologies for those who don't like reading, but this mod is full of it. So um, yeah. Well, he's south of us, so we should probably deal with him first. A bastion of freedom. Russia is broken. It was shattered without mercy by Nazi firepower. Even now, in the afterglow of their victory, Nazi planes scream and rattle overhead, sneering at us while they destroy our cities and murder our children. It was also torn apart from within by traitors, collaborators, men without loyalty or principles, men who live only to sate their lust for power and blood. Murderland was destroyed from deep within, it was abysmal fractures, evil and turny poured forth, sweeping away what little we had left. But Lov scan stands as a bulwark against the black tide, a candle in the dark, the last bastion of freedom. We'll fight with every drop of blood in our bodies to preserve our freedom. Yeah, let's do it. We start off with... Oh, we actually have two civilian factories we can build with. Let's build one a year, and two a year. Right, research, we'll go with... I think industrial stuff, yep. Batch production methods two, and civilian construction two. Remove divisions and training. Outdated equipment in use. 
That is fine. I'll happily use the outdated equipment. PP uh, Mo's in the Gant. We'll keep that in production. I'm not going to put the PPSH right now. Uh, I have a funny feeling we're probably quite far behind in Gant. Anyways, up with the speed. Let's get going. So I'm hoping. Yep. Oh, he's cautious. Charismatic organizer. He's an armor officer, of course. Rokozovsky can be our boy. And Vival Batov can be our general. So how strong is El Lazar's army? Three to seven. Okay, we need to build up some more divisions. That is fine. We've got minus six stability right now, which is not great. I'm actually doing okay in guns, but I'm going to keep it on the Mosin-Nagant for the time being. What we're going to do is we're going to... Oh my gosh. What? We have we have that much money, and we don't have any debt. What a glorious day for us! Anyways, our templates not looking too bad. Oh, of course, the Reich's last conquest, the space race, has been won. Light infantry. That's a little bit better. That's a pretty thick boy. RPG. Um, support equipment, please. I don't even think we've got artillery. No, we've not even got artillery in production. Alright, wait, we've got five factories, so we'll do that. Dear Anna, Paval put the sealed envelope aside and reached for the stack of reports on his desk. He pulled one from the top and carefully read it. Over. Maxim Pavlovich Karkajan, born 30th of the 2nd, 1934. 240, uh, 214th Battalion, 52nd Regiment, 139th Rifle Division, KIA in a skirmish south of Kamensk, Urolsky. He flipped the report over and sighed sadly. Married, two children, both four years old. Drawing his pen from his ink, well, he plucked a piece of paper from his stationery and began to write. Please say my dearest and most genuine sympathy on the loss of your husband. Another letter, another tragedy. Nothing he could write would ease her pain. He could, words describe the Inscritable. The sorrow, the fear, the anger. Maxime died for no reason, killed by a faceless enemy and reduced to a name and photographed on a piece of paper. But he was so much more than that. A soldier, a lover, a husband, a father, now just a corpse. How many more would die before Russia was reunited? How many more letters would have to be written? Thought made Pavel's insides turn. Maxime was a hero to not only the soldiers with whom he served, but all of Russia. I wish you and your family the very best as you deal with this unthinkable tragedy. If there's anything I can do to ease your pain, I welcome that opportunity. I will fold up the letter and slid it inside an envelope, sealing it with a wax stamp. Put the envelope aside and reached for the stack of reports on his desk. My do I have deepest sympathy. Pavel Ivanovich Batov. I've just realised coloured buttons I've actually got coloured buttons on and it's <laughs> kind of sorted out some of them up here. Um Assassin Strikes Hitler, who is going to be announced has his um Successor. I mean, Mr. H. YouTube, you didn't hear anything. Mr. H. Mr. H. I think I'm probably going to go ahead and maybe even get some more light infantry. How bad are you in comparison to the infantry? Oh, you're a pretty goth. Borman has been named as a successor. Yeah, you do like half the damage. Hmm. Not ideal. Anyways, a bastion of freedom is done. Look around you. Look around you, fellow Russians. Tell me, what do you see? Do you see the devastation, the sickness, the death, the anarchy, the chorus of death that rings from Arkhanath, uh, oh gosh, Arkhangelsk to Kamchatka, Chatka, sorry, I'm, I'm terrible pronouncing Russian names. Do you hear the cracking of the hooves on stone and, stone and the great horns on in the horsemen's approach? Do you see the madness just beyond our borders? What of the north, where the word of a petty criminal is law? What of Truman? Those people are slaves to terror and Omsk, whose leadership would have millions slaughtered in the blink of an eye in the name of revenge. If you do, my fellow Russians, then you see why we must preserve our freedom. We get some political power. Oh my gosh. Morning meal in the district. Squinted, squinted peer to the bottom of the cast iron pot, the muddy soup that coated its innards. Beans stuck to its forms, form, sorry, the, like perils among a choppy sea. Squint had to admit, it was not very nutritious nor filling, but the food was food. Of this gaze to the line of men, women and children who awaited their daily ration of bread and soup, he sighed. It was probably nothing, not enough either. 
Squint looked at the metal platter beside him, a few crumbs uh, blurring with a dull, slate-coloured surface. Beside him stood Squeaker, the recruit, whose rifle was un uh, unslung. Occasionally, Private had to yell a high-pitched squeal to keep the crowd in order. The little rifle, the men and women in that line would laugh at Squeaker's voice. Hey, Squint said, catching the newcomer's eye. Do you need help? Do you want to swap new guy? No, Squeaker tightened his voice, trying to sound beyond his years. I fine, I can do this. The kid just uh, got dropped into a squad full of mean-faced veterans and was trying to sound like he belonged there. All the others didn't like him much, but Squint saw some grit in the Squeaker's demeanour. A desire to live above and beyond the call. Give him time, Squint said to Baker. Give him time. If you say so, Squint wasn't much either at the start. He could hardly see, hence the nickname Squint. His breath fogged up his barely fitting prescription glasses and he took them down to clean them. He heard a whir and a roar overpowering the dim of the crook. German squeaker screamed, his voice shrill with terror. Duck, duck, wasting no time. Squint dropped his spectacles and lay still, his heart beating, the cavity of his chest down, buzzing and then silence. It took a good few minutes before the uh, procession could continue. Oh yeah, so that's one thing I didn't actually show off. The National Spirits, Luftwaffe terror bombing. Uh, I think everybody yeah, everybody in Russia is affected by that at the start. They, they're just bombing us to death. Um, we also have Not So Red Army, which is not helping us. Uh, the Siberian Black League, we have low Black League influence, so we bonus defense gets a minus 5. And the revisionist influence, we've got minus 10 defense and 5 stability against the uh, Western People's Republic. Anyways, three ordinary dis uh, dissidents. To their pa uh, patrons of the bar, the three men were remark unremarkable. Possible to pick out in a crowd. They were banking on that, after all. Boris Yeltsin, Yevgeny Primakov, and Alexander Tizyakov seated themselves in a booth, ordered their drinks, and got to talking. We have to be bolder, Boris said. I've been to the protest. There are thousands of people in the city alone who believe change is possible, that democracy is possible. We have to spread the word this government does not represent them. True, liberty gives people ballots, not bullets. To do that, we need to push more newspapers and hold more rallies. Both his associates stumbled over one another, trying to respond first. Two of my guys were jailed last week for distributing provocative literature, uh, Yevgeny said. If we start promoting what is effectively treason, they might shut us down for good, and that means I'll go to prison too. Think about our expenses, Bor Borya, Alexander said. Newspapers and flyers are expensive. Rallies are even more expensive. We can't keep pulling money from my contacts without Rokozovsky noticing. Then he follows the paper trail and we... I get it, I get it, Boris said, waving his arms and uh, arms to dispel the conversation as if it were, were cigarette smoke. Of course, we have to be careful. We have to push the envelope here. We have a real shot at building democracy in Russia. We can't squander it. The waiter arrived with their drinks shortly after. Boris raised his small glass of whiskey and smirked at his co-conspirators. A toast to freedom! Boris Yeltsin becomes leader of the Conservative Party. Okay, who have we got? Roman Grishin. Ultra nationalist. I'm willing to keep Rokozovsky around for as long as possible. Not so Red Army. Private Dmitry Sergevich Chernov chewed the tasteless cafeteria of meat. He had been conscripted several years before and could still remember the Third Army's revolution against Tumen. Uh, what he couldn't remember was a day since then when his food and had any flavour. He turned to his friend Private Morozov, who hadn't been in the army as long as he has. Do you ever think that this isn't really what socialism is like? I mean, they told us that after the revolution everyone would be free, but since then, we've been eating the same crap and being yelled at by the same officers like before. Morozov smiled as he lifted up his, uh, lit up a cigarette. Sergevich, I gave up on those foreign lies a long time ago. A few months back I started reading this pamphlet Alexovich gave me. He told me that the true path to avenge those who tortured the motherland and the prosperity all Russians will enjoy once we, re uh, re we vanquish those enemies who had wronged her. Can I see that thing? Just curious, asked Chernov. Morozov took out a small, battered pamphlet out of his coat pocket. The Black League, the rebirth of Russia, said the letters at the top. Oh, the Black League. You can stay away from me. The Siberian Black Army's over there. We will probably have to deal with them. Not as... We'll have to deal with them sooner, though. That's the thing. You actually do have a pretty big tree. Looks like most of our focuses are going to take 35 days. Liberty and death. Nadia heaved the pot of water into the stove and... Wait, how long do I have to read this? How many days? 12 more days. 
Uh, that's when she heard it. It was a voice flowing in through the open window next to her. A stray gust of wind filled the curtains. She pushed past them and stuck her head out of the window. Her senses burst with detail. A large crowd squirmed around the Sphere of Love statue on the street below, spilling over into, onto the road. The voice belonged to a middle-aged man standing on a small wooden platform in the centre of the crowd. Between the mumbling of the crowd and the honk of horns and the hiss of water on the stove, she couldn't make out every word of what the man was saying, but she heard his voice. He was empathetic, booming, passionate. He spoke of liberty and how Rokosovsky had robbed them of it. He paused and the crowd cheered. She did too. Democracy. What an incredible idea. Two black trucks screeched to a halt in the roundabout, their blue and white lights flashing. The black doors the back doors opened, and the black clad figures poured out. Nadia's insides twisted, her fingers gripped the sill. A second voice cut in, amplified by a loudspeaker. It snarled the man at the crowd dispersed. The responses calling him a fascist, a tyrant, a Hitlerite, drowned out his demands. The middle-aged man was gone, a few of the black figures lobbed smoked, smoking casters in the crowd. In front of the crowd recoiled backwards, gunshots, the men in black surged forward, screaming. Nadia stepped back from the window, she was shaking. Her hand struck the side of the pot and it slid off the stove, spilling boiling water onto her leg and clattering on the floor. She cried out, a string of profanity slipped through her teeth as a wave of pain swept over her, making her dizzy. The unmistakable sounds of truncheons and flesh interspersed with gunshots filled the street below and the sounds of life and ebbing. Liberty comes at the cost of democracy. Come on, Rokozovsky. We need to we need to do good here. It's only got four or seven divisions. Good. As long as our army doesn't grow that quickly. I kinda want infantry that's not got support stuff. No justice, no peace. We observed a, dis uh, a distinct and disturbing rise in civilian discontent against our government as of late. Incidents of vandalism, sabotage, and even physical confrontations with police or military personnel have been reported all across our nation. However, most of these incidents have occurred in Sverdlovsk itself, which could be no surprise. The most uh, probable cause of this wave of unrest is the recent 46 Prospect Lina incident, which led to the deaths of six and injured ten others. Details are spotty at best, but all reports suggest it began in the morning when a mob of civilians assembled unlawfully to listen to a speech from a political fugitive whose identity has yet to be determined. Local garrison responded approximately half an hour later. They announced an assembly was illegal in order the mob to disperse. The mob reportedly responded by throwing bricks. When tear gas was deployed to prevent any further violence or property damage, they attacked soldiers with chains and steel pipes. It would be a riot ended when the garrison opened fire despite having no explicit orders to do so. Marshal Rokozovsky and the High Command have debated how best to respond to this tragedy. Some generals believe that the soldiers involved in the incident should be arrested. Quick and public arrests are what the public wants and would put an end to the, any thoughts of rebellion. Plus, those men fired on civilians. Their arrest is a matter of uh, morality. However, other members of the High Command argue that the soldiers were acting in self defence. Ryan is the one who instigated the violence. Arrest of the soldiers would make the government look inept and severely damage morale. In the end, Rokozovsky has the final word. Justice for the fallen. Justice for the Fallen. Gosh, crack down on the Black League. Yeah, we're going to have to start doing that. Yeah, we're definitely going to have to start doing that. We do have a decent number of things. Train our troops. Purchase infantry equipment. Don't think we're gaining much political power that quickly. 0 0.4 a day. At least we're getting 35 here, so I'll use some of that. Bedroom candles. The critter came to Anatoly's house again today. Father, whose joints creaked along with the wooden foreboards, moved to answer the call. In the darkly lit bedroom, Anatoly waited for his old man to return. The critter needed to understand that much as Anatoly would have liked to fight in the front lines, his sick father needed him more. He stared at the flames gnawing on the wick of the slowly melting candle as it turned in, it burned into his eyes. We are sinners of age, a firm, resolute voice echoed through the hallways of the small house. It faded, becoming faint booms and reverb, uh, reverbs, its words blitter, uh, blurring with the evening's noise. The neighbor's dog was barking, and the mild breeze stirred the air. Officer, I beg your pardon, his father said, words laden with fatigue and age, but I need him, surely understand. Boom and reverb, the voices moved back and forth, parrying, attacking, reposting. To Anatoly, it did not matter one whit. He had the door slammed closed. The impromptu reception was over. When the old man returned, Anatoly helped lift his legs and arms onto the bed, balancing his head on a ragged, dirty pillow. The light illuminating his father's face and the grey hair became threads of silver in the glimmer of faint candle fire. 
Do not live the life as a soldier, I totally heard him say. Do not. Do not. Drift to the realm of sleep and snored. Okay, right, we've done look around you. Now we've got not all hope is lost. Defend your mother. We're getting some stability, which is good. The marshal gives us a nice few bonus. Fortified homes, fortified factories. Okay, by the looks of things, we're going to be doing some quite good stuff here. We've half a terror bomb and goes there. Okay, good. Not all hope is lost, my gosh. Throughout Russia, the grief the Germans cause cannot be more apparent. Former Union shattered in the pieces cannot protect this people. With the bombs falling from the sky, all that reside below know only panic and fear. Dreams of liberty, freedom, and plenty can do naught but die, torn by shrapnel and force. All the more land from the uh, west to the east face a plague even more sweeping than any anger or disease, hopelessness, that life will go on as it had before under terror and violence. In the lands of West Siberia, however, a lone beacon of hope remains, smothered in the cold and left to die in the fall of the Union, yet refusing to die. To all those, to all who would dare rise to challenge fate, the doors to the Marshal's army remains open. To those who hope, to those who refuse to sur surrender the innocent wish for a better tomorrow, the military district shall welcome its comrades in arms in its march to an ideal future. Good, and crack down the button, what does it actually do? Manpower, change of power, all oh, right. We'll do it. Now I want to kind of put down their influence. Black League has been cut. The passing of one's father. So, the recruiter said, his voice bumbling with concern. Is your father well? No, Anatoly said. Fragments of the conversation came to him in the dark bedroom where his father slept. Tonight, too, his father had been unable to rise and attend to his duties. Anatoly found himself beside the candle, with the flames gnawing on the wick, spreading an aroma of melting lard, perfume from tormented souls. In the depths of his fatigue and exhaustion, Anatoly sat beside the bed. Anatoly did not know the nature of the sickness that plagued his father, once his old man had a healthy complexion and a slight paunch belt. Um, Light the outline of his belly, those excesses were gone. Where there was once fat, only bone remained. Where there were energy and drive, only fatigue and lethargy settled. He could not walk, and his hands regularly shook, as if alive and separate from his will. Literally knew that his father's time quickly approached. He stared at the gent that gently snoring face, a visage of genital gentle illness. Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, Anatoly resigned himself to that fact, and to be everywhere. Elsewhere, sorry. Finland, Sweden, or Norway, his father might have been all right. Rising from his wooden, worn stool, he made for his room, staring at, uh, stealing a glass at his father before leaving, by the stroke of midnight, he heard the snoring cease. And so ends in our life in the district. Sad. It's sad, but all well. Comes to us all eventually. Oh, recruitment drive, my gosh. For your name and age, Baker said to the recruit, on this form, please. As a lieutenant of the district, he'd seen many men and women who signed for a tour of service. Some chose a life because of the patriotic sentiments, a heroic thing to do, but some did not live up to the expectations set by their intentions. Others of the sheer pragmatism, and this category of people a Baker sympathised with. After all, Rokosovsky did not deal in chips or rubles, but bread and soup. The man who faced them, however, belonged in the same hole that Baker once did. People who had no choice but to sign up for the dirty work of operating machines that kill. The prospective uh, recruit looked worn, rough and shorn. Long, unkept hair and a four o'clock shadow slowly emerging from that chin. The man looked desperate, destitute, thin as well. Baker could not believe that he was only 18. Gleb had recommended his, this desolate, deprived person. Father was a friend, Gleb said. And besides, he was of age. An orphan then. The allegedly young man filled in the form and showed it to Baker. Twin... 20 signed Anatoly Danilovich Morozov. Thin unkept, Twig shall be his nickname. If it were anyone else, Baker would have crossed out their old names and give them their new sobriquets. I, I've never seen that word before. As things stood, he could not bring himself to do so. Proceed to the medical office, Baker said. If the doc says yes, I'll have you kitted out and sent to boot. An almost impeccable nod. Imperceptible. Not. Uh, just before I actually left him, however, Baker patted his soldiers. You're in good hands, Baker said. I've been through the same things. It's all right. Tears simmered into a sob. Yes, I totally said. 
Thank you. He accepted his service. Gosh, I love this graphic novel. It's one of the best there is. Five days. Good. Deserters in the ranks. Oh, gosh. Corporal Melnikov finished up the last of the Borscht. Borscht? Borscht? Serve for him. Savouring every last drop of the, uh, the savoury soup. It was a long time since he had anything warm to eat and he wasn't sure when the next time he would have one would be. As he looked up, the rest of his squad seemed to be enjoying the soup too. It's getting late. Do you want to stay for the night? The aged... Um, Vaya Cheslav Yako Yevlev asked them. It had been a long time since anyone came to his cottage, so he wasn't sure if there'd be room for guests. But he thought it would, uh, was at least the polite thing to do. We'd love to stay some more, but I'm afraid we must continue our mission, the corporal replied. HQ will be very disappointed if we are late. Yakolev nodded. He was surprised when Melnikov and his squad appeared outside his cottage that afternoon, but the corporal explained they were on a classified mission from Servdlosk that nobody must know about. So it made sense they must make haste. As night fell, the squad transver traversed the vast forest that surrounded the cottage. It was difficult to see the stars, but luckily Melnikov had smuggled a map from the offices. As they crouched down and gazed at it, a warmth that they didn't feel um, since leaving the old man's house entered their faces. A short walk southwest, and they would finally cross the border to to, to freedom. Implement harsher restrictions. We must give incentives to stay. And that's just put us in a negative political power, but that's fine. That is fine. Right, are we actually going to be able to move on a little bit further before another pop-up comes up? My gosh. Yeah, I kind of... You're not actually too bad. I don't really want to change you. You're... Do we have one division on that? We don't even have anti-tank in production. Or do we? Is that what... Oh, the... maybe we do. That's maybe what the RPG is. That is what the RPG is. Uh, Meng Jiang has defeated the Mongolian People's Front in a war. And they're probably going to go after them again. Oh my days. <laughs> the drill instructor waited until the last of his batch of recruits. A scrawny runt named Anatoly Morozov was seated before he began. Sit up straight, dogs. Look at me right now, he shouted, his voice like thunder. Dozens of backs straightened. Some recruits jumped in their seats. He introduced himself as Sergeant uh, Kutuzov and also introduced the two officers flanking him as Sergeants Terezchenko and Bazin. Our mission is to train each of you to become a soldier of the Ural Military District. A soldier of the district possesses courage, bravery, competence and integrity. He is the finest warrior in all of Russia. Am I clear? Yes, sir. A soldier of the district understands two things. One, he is Russian and therefore his duty is to protect the Russian people. You are not here for revenge. You're not here for glory. You're here because you owe it to the millions of fellow Russians crushed under Mr. H's boot. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Two, he is part of the Third Army and therefore his loyalty is to the Third Army. You will be just as loyal to your fellow soldier as you will be to me or Batov or Rokozovsky himself. Each and every man sitting in this room depends on you, giving it everything you've got. That as well as your devotion to forge a new, stronger, safer Russia is all we ask of you. Understand those two things. I will not fail in my goal, just as you will not fail in yours. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Getting some manpower from that. Good. Uh, Galina Ardyomova gritted her teeth as she carefully measured out the food on the counter, calculating the best way to divide the day's rations. Her breathing was laboured as she realised that there was 425 grams less of cabbage than she thought. Why did they have to reduce the vegetable ration? She thought, no matter, she can do this. She was able, she was the sole adult in the house, so she needed the most food. No, it was the children who needed the most, but which child? Um, she looked at the three children playing in the corner. Deniska, Katya, and Olive's heck. Deniska was the oldest, which was it worth letting him grow while the younger children starved? No. Olzik, the youngest, needed the food the most. Galina stood there. Glancing back and forth at the children and the rations in the counter, she divided them and counter divided the food again and again, trying to calculate the best way to split the food. Before screaming and collapsed into her chair, if only Carol were here, 
If she could listen to him laugh, maybe she could regain the strength to finish her work again. And just like that, as she opened her eyes, there was Kachi up with a package and a letter in her head. Don't be sad, mummy. Daddy sent us a present from the army. Kachi opened the package and began to laugh. Laughed the winds of the fate that caught her in this very minute. Laughed the joke that was our life. Laughed at the contents of the package. Rations, military issue, canned vegetables, 425 grams. Recruit civilians into the militia. We need them in the factories. Yeah, so let's recruit them into the militia. Rokozovsky's kind of losing his control a little bit, but... We'll, we'll sort things out. Only boost them by one-on-one. -on -one. Not all hope is lost. No, it's not. Defend your mother. The purpose of the military district has been clear from the very beginning. Protection, not expansion. The Marshal Rokozovsky has, um, has directed and dictated itself to the security of Russians living under its rule. In a Russian torn by genocidal violence and ideological extremism, many ideals of Melquintovst reform cannot sustain the livelihoods of millions. A firm but gentle hand must guide their way to the future, shielding them from danger within and without. All who join the district shall receive a rifle, rations and pay. There are the three means that enable a man to defend his family. Father, mother, sons and daughter, whether brother, sibling, sister or stranger, one more pair of hands shall ensure that no more lives will be lost. There are dangerous dangers abound, but with the people marching forward hand in hand with the district, they shall know no fear. More support for local power, yay! Alright, I'm just having a wee look Lenin's mausoleum. Bunker building, okay. I don't know how we're gonna fare in wars to be fair. Right, so once that's done with the trust in the marshal probably then go down here because we can get one factory yeah one off map military factory which will be quite nice oh there we go i told you it was coming i told you it was coming factory output our industrial expertise societal development will begin to slowly improve defense on core territory we're going to have plus five percent by the end of that plus 7.5 percent that's pretty good their influence is going to grow Virginist propaganda. Uh, Private Dmitry Olegovich Kapan signed aside as he looked at the letter, slumping down the barks bed. They've cut the severe rations again, he said to his friend Private Agapov. Either get the feeling that this isn't how socialism is supposed to be like. They told us everyone would be equal. Now we're all equally starving. Of course, Agapov said. It's, a, it's the vanguard party um, of workers who are supposed to lead the revolution to victory. A bunch of generals pretend to be socialites or just military dictators under another name. And this is um, Olegovich. The reason why our families are starving is because the brass doesn't care about anything but their own self gain. That's why the old Soviet Union failed too. Want to know the real way forward, the real path the socialism? Kaban nodded. Anything would be better than this husk of an army pretending to be a country. Agabov took a worn pamphlet from his pocket and handed it to the Kaban. The title read Stalinism, the way to the future. Ah, uh, search them up. We don't really have... Oh gosh, an ultimatum. We received an ultimatum from... Oh no. Oh dear. They're wanting tribute, are they? I don't bloody think so. Alright, I don't care that we're short of equipment. We need another two divisions right now. Uh, receive an ultimatum from um, Ugra. They are demanding that we hand over a tribute of loot or else they will raid us and take it from us anyways. We're at an impasse this side. Do we decide to engage in confrontation with Ugra? Possibly risking our men dying at the hands of our enemies? Or do we instead stand down and cave into their demands, giving them the desired loot, allowing our men to live to fight another day? No. We will begin a border dispute. Just gonna wait a little bit longer for that. When's it timing out? 11 days. Just wait until their organization's higher. 
What's happening? Creation Autumn. Okay. Right, um... Yes, we will not back down. Great Marshal Rokosovsky, uh, formerly of the Union, now controls what little remains of the military district. To the people of Serdlosk, he re represents a final, desperate hope of stability and liberty. The burden imposes such strain on his physique as he takes on the responsibility for millions. His soldiers, staff members, and people beg him to reconsider his task. They delegate his duty and rest. He refuses, a lone man against the advancing tide of tyranny and authoritarian rule. As such, there is no other course of action than to trust the Marshal to do his obligation. Um, from all levels of society of the military district, all shall take the marshal at his word. That he is experienced and thus knows best for the beggars, from the beggars and the homeless of the cities and villages to the highest echelons of command in the Spartan quarters. All will look to the marshal as a beacon of life, liberty and happiness amid a t Russia torn by war and chaos. So we get division recovery plus 10, five stability and uh, some party increase. You're on your way. That's good. Looks like we're going to win the border dispute. Pricks. Oh, there they are. The enemy's defeat. Recent reports have been sent in of an overwhelming victory against a recent party of raiding bandits. In a brutal standoff, they were decimated by our valiant defense forces. Now their bodies lie scattered and mutilated by war. With survivors dashing for cover and retreating into the misty frontiers, our soldiers chant songs of victory and heroism in the face of invading evil. The Russian bloody defeat will certainly teach them a lesson about attacking the lands of Servolosk. For years to come. Good. Glorious. Fantastic. Right, what's gonna happen here? Do we get do we get something telling us that we've we've done a bad I bet you'll start again. Oh Jesus, minus ten, Siberian Black Leak. Minus fifteen percent against them now. Oof. That better not be these guys. So we're not going to stand a chance. Anyways, guys, I'm going to leave that episode there. Oh, the Mongolian Civil War. Okay. Sablin is doing okay. Right, anyways, guys, thank you very much for watching. I know we didn't exactly do a lot of folk says or anything there. There was a lot of reading. But I hope you enjoyed nonetheless. And I shall be back very soon for some more. Till then, take care. Cheer bye. The now.